President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. There are images and sounds burned into the psyche of the United States. President John F. Kennedy assassinated while riding in a car through Dallas, Texas. Friday, November 22nd marks the 50th anniversary of that fateful day. A commemoration is planned in Dallas. And CCTV's Ginger Vaughn is live there tonight with Insight. Ginger. Elaine, a three-block area known as Dealey Plaza is virtually closed down, locked down here. That's where President Kennedy was shot and killed on November 23rd, 1963. And though 50 years have passed, the, the sounds and the images are still very, very vibrant memories for many here. It's been called one of the United States' darkest days. Three gunshots fired into the presidential Good motorcade. John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time. Two of those bullets tore into John F. Kennedy, killing the American president. It's something that I've read about for uh, 50 years. And uh, now to actually be here and experience and to look at the, uh, you know, the angles and see the ground and so on, it's, it's, it's just uh, extremely interesting. His legacy is that he's still inspiring people 50 years you know, later and will for another 50 years, I'm sure. Of particular interest to visitors are the landmarks that became part of history that day in Dallas the Texas School Depository, where those fatal shots were fired, Parkland Hospital, where the president was taken after the attack, and the Texas Theater, where the gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald, was arrested. When I heard the shots, I thought some idiot has fired the shots as a demonstration. It was inconceivable to me that the shots would have been directed at Kennedy. Until I then a reporter for NBC News, Robert McNeil, was in Dealey Plaza when Kennedy was shot. It ushered in, uh, it sort of opened the door to all the nightmarish things that uh, seized this country by the throat for the rest of the decade of the 60s. Visitors from around the world have made the trip here to Dallas. Thousands of people are expected to be on hand tomorrow to commemorate the day that JFK was killed. A simple ceremony is planned. It will last about an hour and feature a short speech by the mayor of Dallas. Church bells will ring and there will be a moment of silence for President Kennedy. But no one from the Kennedy family is expected to attend. There have been a limited number of seats open to the public for the ceremony, about 5,000 in all. And we've also learned that about 600 members of the media will be present, including CCTV News. Elaine? All right, Ginger Vaughn, live from Dallas, Texas. Thank you for that. In the 1,000 days of his presidency, John F. Kennedy faced a nuclear crisis sent American troops into Vietnam and watched as the Soviets built a wall to divide the German city of Berlin. CCTV's Jessica Stone takes a look at Kennedy's foreign policy approach and the legacy it left around the world. Even before he became a United States president, foreign policy was bred into John F. Kennedy, first through his father, an ambassador to the United Kingdom, and later as a PT boat commander in the American Navy. Ask not! What your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Within three months of those words, President Kennedy backed a plan to help CIA-trained Cuban exiles overthrow Cuban leader Fidel Castro. After the first airstrike revealed American support for the operation, Kennedy canceled a second airstrike. He uh, obviously made a big mistake with the Bay of Pigs in not providing air support uh, for the Cuban exiles. I, I think he learned from that that uh, if you're going to, to uh, work with covert operations and you, and you promise people that you're going to back them up, you have to have their back. Fifty years later, Kennedy's niece, Carrie Kennedy, speaking at the RFK Human Rights Awards luncheon, says the president learned something else. After the Bay of Pigs fiasco, Jack told Arthur Schlesinger, quote, I would like to take the CIA and cut it into a thousand pieces and blow it to the wind. He reigned, he reigned in the agency, fired its director and deputy director, slashed, slashed its budget by 20 percent and stripped it of its military advisory role. Days later, Kennedy sent 400 U.S. Special Forces into South Vietnam to train soldiers fighting the Communist North. 
In so doing, Kennedy launched a protracted, controversial war that would cost more than 58,000 American lives and end without achieving its anti-communist objectives. He already knew uh, what a struggle was to fight Japanese imperialism, and so he wanted to push back against uh, communist expansion as well. And so for the time, he, I think he made the right decisions, but uh, once you get involved in a war, you never know where it's going to lead. A year later, when Kennedy was shown these satellite pictures of a Soviet ballistic missile buildup in Cuba, his efforts to push back against Soviet communist expansion in Latin America continued. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Kennedy declared any attack from Cuba would require swift American military response. Ultimately, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev agreed to move the missiles. The U.S. pledged not to invade, and Kennedy secretly promised to remove American nuclear warheads in Turkey. The two would later agree on the limited test ban treaty for nuclear weapons in 1963. I have today signed an executive order providing for the establishment of a peace corps. While Kennedy's brief presidency was certainly marked by conflict, his foreign policy lives on in a lasting push for peace through the creation of the U.S. Peace Corps. The Peace Corps gives us a chance to show a side of our country which is too often submerged. And in his daughter, Caroline, who recently became the U.S. ambassador to Japan. to Japan. Thank you so much. Welcome to Japan. Jessica Stone, CCTV, Washington. Though 50 years have passed since President Kennedy's assassination, the fascination with the man has not. Robert Dalek is a historian and is the author of Camelot's Court, Inside the Kennedy White House. And he joins us here live. And Robert, for our international audience, describe this whole idea of Camelot. Well, Camelot, which lives on, is the idea that there was a special moment in the country's history when this Kennedy administration provided such hope for a much brighter future, perhaps an end to the Cold War, an end to a conflict with the Soviet Union and with China. And so there was the feeling that Kennedy's youth, his uh, enthusiasm, his rhetoric, he was a brilliant spokesman, so to speak, for peace and for a better day ahead. And Americans remember that to this day. You see, they don't often remember what a president does. But they remember his words, and they remember if he were an inspirational figure. Kennedy, to this day, has approval ratings of between 75 and 85 percent. Mm -hmm. There's no other president in recent history who touches him. Well, and to say that Americans were captivated by the coverage of his assassination would be a huge understatement. And I want to play you something from a couple of journalists who covered the assassination at the time, and they note how this forever changed news coverage. By 6 o'clock that night, 95, 97 percent of the TV sets owned in the United States were on and stayed on, and people were glued to the coverage. Newspapers, print journalism was the big thing. Suddenly, and I saw this happen within days of the assassination, people were holding press conferences, and they were holding up till the TV cameras all got set up. How much did the country change because of this assassination? You know, Elaine, it was a blow to the country's self-esteem, to what we call its amour propre. This is not the way politics is conducted in America. For a president to be killed was just such an unacceptable event. Now, there had been a president named William McKinley who was killed in 1901, but 50 years after his death, he was forgotten. Kennedy, because of television, still has this phenomenal hold on the public's imagination. We can see him, the live televised press conferences he had, charming, witty, young. And of course, there's a certain irony in all this in that uh, he looked so vibrant and so energetic. In fact, he had a lot of health problems, but this was hidden from the public. It's all part of this Camelot myth. Well, and of course, you know, he had the family to go along to complete the picture. Absolutely. You know, when Kennedy was campaigning for office, you wrote about how he promised that someone promised someone that the key for the country is a new foreign policy that will break out of the confines of the Cold War. And you also wrote about the brilliance of several of Kennedy's closest advisors, like his Secretary of Defense, his National Security Advisor. Yep. How much did he depend on them? Initially, dependent on them a lot. But he was very frustrated by the Bay of Pigs failure. And he walked around after that saying, how could I have been so stupid? And he went to see Charles de Gaulle in France 
And de Gaulle said to him, get the smartest people around you, giving the best advice they can give, but at the end of the day, you must make up your own mind. And he remembered what Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. And so he became much more self-dependent after that. Well, times have changed, and obviously Washington is mired in gridlock. How would President Kennedy do now? Well, it's such a different world. With the 24-7 news cycle, you see, would we not know about his womanizing, about his health problems? Uh, there would have been huge difficulties. The fact that he only had a 1,000 days, it's a tabula rasa, an unwritten slate. You can write anything on it that you like. And so, you know, it it's, gives him a kind of standing that any president who serves for four or eight years really can't achieve. All right. Author and historian Robert Dalek, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. My pleasure.